Most of the images you're going to see up here are actually from the first Indicade in Bellevue, not Utah. And, and E3. This is our first As well E3. as some E3 images. So you'll see a couple of images of our E3. Oh my god, that's us. And it says on the bottom what each one is. Um, and we have a few sort of a celebrity, uh, um, what do you call that when somebody just shows up in a movie for a second? Cameo. Cameo appearances by some celebrity game designers who you may see in backgrounds of pictures. And this is... Uh, oh, that's our first poster. That's our first poster, um, done by John Bergerman, who did the banner that's out here. Um, some graphics. Anyway, so that's what that is, and it's just going to be circulating throughout the talk. We could sit here and watch it, I guess, well, or we could... <laughs> exactly. Oh, where's Adam Robozoli? I invited him to join Adam us. Adam Robozoli, there's uh, Jason Rohr, uh, Lau. Doug Wilson is prominently featured, yes. Maybe. There's, There's uh, oh, Sam, wow, that's yeah. Sam Roberts. <laughs> I look young. Showing people how to play There's games. Elon There's Elon Lee. Lee, who's one of our first attendees. That was our talk. We sat in a circle. Um, there is Genova Chen on the right side. Yeah, that one was labeled with my name. It was distinctly oh, not me. Was, yeah. oh, this is the <laughs> Sorry, wrong, game, wrong yeah. label. I may have rushed through this. There's, There's the Yen Yedda Boost team. Guys that game is Austin. beautiful. There is a, oh, this is actually, oh, I want to explain what these are. Um, we actually asked some of the developers to create images, high resolution images, and we asked Jason to take the entirety of Passage and stack it so that we could have it in a single image. Um, and these other ones are just screenshots from some of the other games we had in the first festival. But that print we, of Jason's actually lives in my office now. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, they were all printed on canvas. We wanted to kind of highlight the artistry of some of the visuals in the games. This is Takahashi's Nabi Nabi Boy, Ibn Ab, now on the PlayStation. Yep. Uh, probably about five of the first year games ended up on PlayStation eventually. Yep. And yet it moves, ended up yep. on Nintendo. Braid. Uh, Braid eventually gained a PlayStation. Night Journey, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there we go. Rooms, this is a great game for anybody who hasn't played and it. And Rooms ended up on Vita, actually. Oh, the graveyard. Yeah. Oh, the graveyard. Yep. Uh, the graveyard is actually on um, Jump right now, There's I believe. Nothing. Night journey. journey. I don't know why that cursor is up there. I'd love to get rid of that. So uh, as, anyway. we're, as we're sitting here reminiscing Hi. over these slides. We're just going to ignore these people no. here because no. they're just. I actually think, well, I mean, we just wanted to talk a little bit about our history, I think, uh, yeah. because we don't do it that often. But the best place for us to start about that is, if there's anyone here who has questions about Indicade or where Indicade came from or what Indicade was like 10 years ago, uh, or if you just all want to watch the slideshow, we'll continue to just narrate it. I'm good <laughs> that. We need, He needs a mic. Um, why did Indicate start? Why does it exist? Stephanie. Um, well, it's a long, complicated uh, question, but uh, it took us about two years before we were able to launch our first Indicate. But the reason it exists is because there was nothing out there and no place for independent work or work that was different other than the like mainstream AAA to really be celebrated. There was the IGF, but it, as it is now, is kind of just part of the trade show floor and wasn't really a cultural celebration of independent games. And so based on like a bunch of different factors, a group of people in my parents' living room and I came up with the idea and started thinking, gosh, who is, who is the Robert Redford of the, of the game industry? And we could not think of one Robert Redford. So we decided that we would just take up that, um, that torch and, and bring it forward. And sometime the next year, first Celia and then Sam joined and has we've worked together for the last 11 years. And I want to add that for the full story of this, will be featured in the forthcoming IndieCade 10th anniversary book called IndieCade at 10. This is my uh, proof of concept prototype that's full of <laughs> Greek text. Um, but um, this is our 2010 poster, if I'm not mistaken, which prominently features both 2008 and 2009 games, but um, we'll tell this story in a lot more detail in here for those who are have the tenacity to read through it. <laughs> but, but just back to that, when we started, there was, everybody we went to said um, that we were trying, it was like pushing a boulder uphill. People said nobody's ready for those games yet, and um, they were wrong. Well, actually, I want to interview Seed because there were a number of people that were on our early advisory group, 
And Stephanie and I originally met at USC, and then she recruited me um, after, what, a year or so of working on it. We had, uh, Tracy was on our early advisory board, Eric Zimmerman, and there was a, a double-edged sword because it was, this is a great idea and we really need this, but nobody's ready for it. Um, but because of the first part, those people were willing to help us basically push the boulder up a hill, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> well I mean, I think it's important to remember that we're talking about a world before Facebook was a force, before Twitter was a force, right? So when you wanted to get your independent game, you know, which, by the way, was just a sort of nascent... Imaginary nas category. An, an imaginary <laughs> nascent idea in itself, um, you know, some of us had had some early success. So we had had some early success in 2006 with Cloud and then followed up by Flow, um, mostly because there wasn't anyone out there. And... and um, I think I gave a talk in Australia, and we got like 10,000 hits and you know a bunch of downloads on cloud. And then <laughs> you started to see that if you could get the word out on these really weird, interesting, you know, experimental games, that people that there was an audience of people out there who wanted to play them, right? But getting the word out and and having some sort of um, you know sense of community around the notion of these experimental independent games that didn't exist yet. And there wasn't, and like I say, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook to go to, right? So how did you get the word out, right? And so there was this notion that, oh, okay, we need to build a community, we need to build a place for these games to be shown, and if we do do that, people will come. But, I mean, it's really key, though, that it was for the public. Um, IGF was probably the first big independent game festival in the U.S. But that was it's really the first. But you local have to, to the GDC. Yeah, you have to pay... Twelve hundred dollars. Well, or something. and just setting that aside, I, I, this is, I think, the super important point about that. There were other venues for some independent game work before that, pretty much exclusively, except for a couple of very time limited things. None of them were standalone, right? Everything was a part of something else, and more importantly than just a part of something else, a second class citizen. Uh, I, you know, uh, so games were not slam important dance. at Slam, slam dance. dance. Games were, IGF is not, it was not important at GDC. There was basically nothing else. There were art exhibits, but those exhibits were usually, all, were often marginalized even in the museums they were at. Occasionally you would get an opening exhibit that went with an academic conference. Again, not the point of what was happening, right? Yeah, so I can, I can address that uh, issue because I was in the first IGF in 2000, uh, 2000. 1999. 1999. Nine, yeah. Um, you were trying to say 2000, but that wouldn't work. No, no, it wouldn't because I submitted my game in 98. I, knew, yeah, I remember that Yeah, it was 1999. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, we were just like ignored. But we built this little community over like three, four days of just the other developers. And it was just, it was an amazing experience just to be talking with other developers in this, in this thing. And, then, and I had been working in industry and I had uh, been laid off or actually, no, I'd quit. Uh, and uh, <laughs> no, hard to remember the difference. I, sometimes I, I said I want. I said I want to raise. They said no. I said bye. Uh, and um, then I just started working my own game. And it was you know just by myself with some you know, some friends, kind of like staying at a crashing at a friend's house. And coming to a festival and being recognized by at least the people who made the selections, and then meeting the other developers was great. And nobody came to our booths. There was like a few people kind of wandering in trying some of the games and kind of like not really, really with what, what company you're with, you know, kind of thing. Um, I was hoping to get some impressions to see if I could find a publisher. And that was just like completely wrong idea at the time. Uh, so yeah, yeah I mean, there, was, was, there was really nothing for the community yeah. outside of just meeting and doing. That's how I met a, made a good friend of Andy Schatz. You know, and he was there. This is also, uh, I thought, something that came out of Slamdance. I mean, the existence of the well, IGF and Slamdance Slam yeah. before this, but it was the same thing. I, there was not a lot of public that came in to see the games at Slamdance, but the developers in that room became very, very, very close. Well, no one was that? actually um, talking about this at the, at the opening session of, of Indicade uh, on Friday when he was saying, he was actually conflating in his mind uh, Slamdance in the beginning of Indicade because, you know, whatever. But, uh, <laughs> but Slamdance was, you know, part of uh, it was held during the the Sundance Festival in Park City, and um, you know the, the the Guerrilla Game Maker Festival inside of Slamdance was held in this little room inside of 
this large community of people who are there all to see films. This right? very hot room. Very hot room <laughs> inside. Without like, any proper ventilation. And, and here we and were no all, all these little developers and we were staying in the cheapest hotel rooms. Most of us are com- like driving from Salt Lake because none of us can afford the super expensive um, hotel rooms that have all been taken up by the filmmaking people, right? So we're like driving in, you know, commuting in in the snow to this tiny little sauna of, of independent games. Yeah. And we all stayed there all day. We never left because we couldn't afford any of the food outside of the... <laughs> also the, true. W- and you couldn't get into any of the movies, you to be perfectly get into the frank. Movies, um, yeah. So we all sat there and played each other's games and, and got to know each other. I didn't tell this story during the first session, but it was literally the only thing I could think about the whole time Genova and Vince were talking about slam dance. So I'm going to tell it now. It is not pertinent or interesting, so I apologize. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at that very first slam dance, uh, there was a lovely game called Rumble Box oh, made yeah. by a couple of DigiPen students. And uh, they did something very smart that has worked for a lot of people since then at festivals. They brought a trophy to give to the person with the high score. Mm. Since no one came to play it except the other developers, it just became an internal room tournament. And we would like be watching, and when the game was empty, somebody would sit down and play for like two hours and just try to run up the highest high score they could. So I was strategic about this. I waited till we were supposed to be done. No one was going to come. And I sat down, I played for another hour and a half. I put like 200, 300,000 points above whoever was behind me, which was Vince. And I was like, done. I'm going to go enjoy myself. But Vince was still in the room because he didn't get kicked out because he was one of the game makers. And he stayed there for like another two hours and stole that trophy from me. And he still has it. That's all. That's my whole story. So, I, yeah, I just want to sort of. That's why there's an indicate. One of the, one of the things. That, um, one of the things I've been doing and working on this book is, is also looking at the larger context. So first of all, what they're describing is what you might characterize as an indie island within another event that was kind of isolated from that event. Now the IGF is one of the biggest draws, but it wasn't back then. But it's also interesting to note that that was a year after we started working on the master's program at USC. And actually 1998 was the year that Georgia Tech launched its games program. So. We keep mentioning all these student projects, Flow, Cloud, DigiPen. Um, These programs were just starting to be formulated, and their history is very, very interlocked with ours. And I think it's really important to, that that's a big part of the story. I was an academic when I started working on IndieCade. Tracy, you know, works at USC. Sam now works at USC. We met at USC, so. um, Yeah, so did Tracy. Yeah, Tra- yeah. USC is a. We, went to we all went to we went to school together. <laughs> I didn't go to USC. But but just uh, J- Jason, do you want to join us? Oh yes, please. And Can we grab another chair for Jason. Oh yeah, no, oh, there, yeah. There's a parade and there's also the podcast fest today. I, I wanted to. I, I just I just wanted to. Um, to when everybody's reminiscing about these, like the beginning of the IGF and slam dance and everything. And when we started IndieCade, we actually looked at all of those things and thought about it a lot. And our first IndieCade um, was kind of in two steps. First, we were kind of part of other events like E3 and Game City and other things. It was just to get the money and get our, you know, get ourselves together to be able and to do it. Um, but. But our first indicate it was really important to us that it was in a cultural institution, so it was in a gallery, that it was standalone, and that it stayed up longer than just like 20 minutes. So it stayed up, it was an actual ex- exhibit in the gallery that stayed up and, and indicate was, it was a whole week. And I invited Adam Ro- Robazzoli to join us, but he's not here, he just had a baby. But he stayed there the whole week with his baby. With his other baby. I know, he just had another baby. Um, <laughs> So it was. It was really. It was amazing to to do that and have our games up for. Somebody a while. was uh, reminding me. I think it was uh, Jason uh, that when I first met him, I was on crutches. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so um, uh, yeah. So when I met you, you were hobbling around the gallery in Bellevue, Washington, um, and I didn't know if you, you know had a long-term injury or, you know, so I'm meeting someone for the first time who's hobbling around, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but I, the story is, what, you could tell the yeah, story. I, I was leaving Stephanie's uh, mother-in-law's, uh, Scott's mom's house, 
uh, to come to the gallery, and I stepped funny on a bump on the curb, and there was a crunching sound, and I put a bag of ice on it because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But before I came to the gallery, I had to get a cable because the projector we were going to use to show flower needed a longer cable than we had. So I drove to uh, Office Max or something, used the shopping cart as a walker, and bought like a 20-foot cable. This is every... When you told the story to me a couple days ago, I thought you were trying to carry a 20-foot table. No, a 20-foot cable. Um, And this is not the first... This is the first of many cables that I had to go get as emergency runs, but... And then I just drove up to the gallery and I called Adam and I said, um, I have the cable and I need someone to drive me to the hospital. <laughs> so I went to Bellevue and got a boot on my foot. So it was a work-related injury. Right. Shh. I think we picked up the cable from you at the hospital. Oh, that's, that's possible, yeah. Yeah, I think we'll that's We'll go right. to no end. We'll stop at nothing to show indie games. I have an anecdote about uh, the, the fact that you were just very deliberate about bringing it to a cultural center. Is as coming in and setting up my uh, my game. I was getting the computer ready, and the people are coming by. And Sam, you introduced me as the artist, and we're like, <laughs> <laughs> it, it didn't even strike me. Really, it was just a, a, such a, a jarring moment. I, I mean, I, it is a small thing, but I, I do think it's something that is different about the way that we started approaching it and have approached it the whole time. It was never uh, a question, right? It was our mission to go out there and tell people that this was incredible, powerful, creative work made by interesting people, right? Uh, But that was, we started from the people making these games are artists, are talented, are brilliant. They're the reason we're here. They're the reason we're doing it. And we try to treat them well in that way. Um, And on some level, that's a thing that, I brought with me a little from Slam Dance because the attitude there was a, a filmmaker-driven attitude. That was a festival that was all about the people showing the film. Uh, and we sort of were like, oh, we want to be all about the people who made the game. Um, and then I think, too, Celia's experience curating before Indiecade was largely in museum spaces, uh, which, again, has a real artist first, let's serve the artists, let's highlight their work attitude. Um, and I think that made a big difference. Sam, I think it might be worth you just touching on the whole Super and Columbine Massacre debacle because I think that that... Is it? I don't know. Well, the, no, no, no. Actually, I think it's really important. Yeah. And I talked we about... We basically it. killed Slam Dance. Yes, killed, they're back. We killed you know them. they're back. No, they killed know, themselves. It, they killed themselves. But sure. I mean, this question of our game's art was a, a very a roiling controversy at the time, and this was really the probably the... Uh, apex of it coming to a head at slam dance. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about that. I, I've talked with Tracy about this a little. Uh, there was a crystallization or a coalescing moment, I think, that essentially it caused. This was an ongoing debate. Lots of the smart people I knew in the space were already at that point pretty irritated with the debate. They were just at the place that I know Tracy was at the time, which was like, the answer is yes. Can we stop talking about it? <laughs> um, <coughs> but There wasn't like a movement, there wasn't a group. Different people knew each other. There had been things like IGF where small communities were coming together. There were small, small communities on the web talking. And this was something that everybody cared about at the time. Um, For a little context, I uh, put a game in the festival called Well, not just you, there was a jury, right? There was a jury, but understand (laughs) that I was most of the jury. I had like, you know, eight jurors. but no, no. I, I, actually, Jason's right to point this out. I didn't discover it on my own. Uh, I did discover it all on my own, actually. I, I emailed the developer. Ask Danny to I emailed apply. the developer and said, I need you to put your game in my festival because I want you to apply. And he did. Uh, but then another juror played the game and said, this is significant and needs to be paid attention to. So I moved it on through the process. And it was selected by me and the jury. Um, and I went to my boss before I selected it. And I said, the jury thinks we should show this. Know that you're going to get some flack. And he was like, we are a punk film festival. We will show that game. Your, your boss's name was Peter... Baxter. Peter Baxter, that's right. I'm going to throw him under the bus for so the next I did, five I minutes. didn't realize that he had known about it and kind of gotten on, on board with you before oh, turning 180. Let's, oh, yeah. <laughs> let's understand this was less probably deep maliciousness and more... Um, absent-mindedness and uninvolvedness, right? 
Well, his employees would come upstairs and tell him things, and he would nod and smile. But he also, <laughs> once you realize the significance of the press backlash yes. around that game, he, he then, thought maybe his whole festival might be in jeopardy. Yeah, and he asked me to remove it, and I said, I don't think we should do that. And so then he told me to remove it, and I removed it. Uh, and then Danny called uh, Kotaku, and Kotaku <laughs> called me. And I told Kotaku some things, and then I went upstairs and I was like, Peter, this is about to get really bad. Um, and then most of the game developers, so this was the third year of the Slam Dance competition, um, the second year I had been running it, and we had a real, uh, I don't know, all-star parade. It was, I mean, it was it was John Blow, and it was John and Kelly, and, Phil Fish. and it was Tracy, and it was Phil Fish, and it was Jason, and... Uh, I, yeah. We so basically when, said, if you are going to disrespect our medium of expression, then we will not come. And you know, this is actually—I just want to say this is—we debated this. Um, so our team at USC was showing Flow, and uh, um, this is pre-Sony, just by the way. So Flow actually began as a student game, and this is a big deal for us. So going to Slam Dance the year before in 2006 had been a a, a really galvanizing moment for us. And we wanted to go back and be with the, the new set of, of artists. And be, we thought, this is going to be such a special thing. And then this happened. And so we debated, like, what should we do? Can we go if we're, going to be, if we're basically going to an event that would censor the, the freedom of speech of, of, a, of a game creator? And we decided, no. And even bigger than that, so first we pulled Flow along with a number of other developers. But then we were also sponsors. We had, we had because we had had such a big... USC was? Yes. Yeah. We had such a big, we had, we, like our hearts had gone out to this little festival. Remember, world prior to Indicate, world prior to, you know, really the IGF really taking off as a place like this. So this was big for us and we had sponsored it. And we, you know, we pulled in, we pulled in protest flow and we said, you got to put it back or we won't come. And you guys didn't. And we got on the phone with Peter and he said, no, I can't have it. And, and we said, well, you're censoring our art form. And so we're, we're not coming and we're pulling our sponsorship, right? Which was even bigger deal. Yeah. And, and, and this was, this was uh, you know, I wrote like a big, you know, statement of values that I posted on our, our website and got like attacked by the pre- people of that ilk. Mm. Um. <laughs> so, uh, so I will just say that uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm ashamed of this at all, but I was one of the only game developers who didn't pull my game out. Now, it's also true that I already had, I didn't have a hotel room. I had a bed in a, in a hostel with 30 other beds, <laughs> the Opry Skis Lodge in Park City. Um, and uh, I also had my plane ticket, and I was flying all the way from New York all the way across the country to come to this. Um, I didn't get the impression that some of the developers had really made travel plans when they pulled out. So I was like, I'm already going. Like, I can't, you know, like, I, I also just like, I don't know. I, I, not that I wanted to win the prize or I wanted to show my game, but just I wanted to come and be yeah. part of the conversation. And it turned out, actually, that there was a conversation. There. A real one. Danny came. Yeah, Danny, the creator of this game. Well, the other thing I was doing uh, at the time in preparation for this, I was all excited. This is like, I had submitted my first game to, um, to the IGF and, Indi and Slam Dance and got rejected by both. Um, I don't know if you remember. I submitted Transcend. Oh, probably you don't remember. It was you no, probably didn't know no, who no, I was. That, to year one, I, I wasn't there. Okay, yeah. No, I think it might have been year two. I, I don't know. Anyway, so then I, I submitted my second game to both of these festivals, IGF and Slam Dance, and got accepted to Slam Dance, rejected by the IGF. And this was like huge for me. This was like, oh my gosh, a game of mine is going to be shown at this place. Um, so I start also was like, what other games are there? And I started. I had an art house games blog, and I started interviewing all the finalists one by one, interviewing, playing their games, reviewing their games. And I just along the way happened to play this game that I would have never found out about, which is Super Column by Massacre RPG, which a lot of people were already really upset about. I mean, it was a lightning rod for controversy long before Slam Dance, and it blew my mind. I mean, it is a really amazing piece of work done by sort of an outsider artist it sort of felt to me and very much so i mean he was deeply a filmmaker researched. i mean he went into the, yeah into their available diaries and tried to reconstruct things from their point of view and um and so i saw this thing i was like wow this is what the kind of thing we should be doing with games um uh, so I totally understood why you guys were boycotting. At the same time, it was like I already had my ticket. So I wrote a big thing about why we should all come to Slam Dance anyway, and 
and I was one, and there were like three, two or three other game developers who were in the same boat, and they were not as big as you guys. Yeah. Right? They were not well known like Jonathan Blow and Phil Fish. Yeah. And well, and also, I mean, and this is one of the things that was very strange about it. There were two teams from DigiPen there that year who wanted to not come, but were forced to by <laughs> their school. Um, uh, and DigiPen was a sponsor because, as well. Yes. Well, because of weirdness, because DigiPen owned their games. Yes. Which was just so strange. They own the man submitted. So, so, so um, this is the only time or the first time when we were started to create Indicate that Indicate and IGF really came together. Yes. And uh, and had a and st- last and time. Ha- <laughs> no, not the last time. No. But Stephanie and Simon Carlos spoke and made statements about what had happened. I mean, this goes back to the point, which is that like suddenly there was this letter signed by all of the leading independent game developers in the world saying, we won't stand for being treated this way. Suddenly there were other organizations saying, this can't happen, and if you won't do it right, we will do it right. And in fact, and- Stephanie going out there and saying, if you won't do it right, we will do it right, is the reason I met. Stephanie. And just, you know, point of history, this is prior to the Supreme Court actually saying that games were speech that needed to be protected, right? So at this time, games were not considered to be protected speech, you know, it, under the Constitution. So this was, a, we were, I mean, we were mad. <laughs> we were really like, Angry about people dissing on our art form, you know. I also want to add that and we had tickets. Just I just want to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure. So let's no talk. Uh, Sam was talking about. So this is really what precipitated Sam reaching out to Stephanie. So maybe you guys can talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the IGF and Indicade were uh, out there talking about Slam Dance, um, and I was actually uh, I was talking to Simon as well at the time and didn't know Stephanie. And uh, something that was in the press release in Stephanie had made, Simon had taken exception to. So he was like, can you respond to this? <laughs> uh, because I can't. And understand, I was in a very awkward position. I had an employer who had an interest that I was employed to protect. And then I believed something that was fundamentally different. Um, This is not a rare thing. People do this all the time. And when the thing that you totally disagree with also is ruining the lives of other people, I think most people don't do it. But it can be very complicated. And in fact, I felt like I could do more good for the space working through how to communicate about this and keep the dialogue going. So I stayed at Slamdance for a year, a year and a half, and spent my time meeting with the community and understanding their needs and explaining what Slamdance had won, uh, had done, being quite frank that I personally disagreed with it, but then trying to push the conversation forward. And so in the course of this, I reached out to Stephanie and said, can we sit down and talk? We're going to interrupt you because our mission has not changed. And um, people have asked us, I can, you can answer in a second, but people have, sorry, people have asked me a few times, they're like, well, you must have been flying by the seat of your pants at the beginning, and you know, how has your mission evolved? And, and we weren't at the beginning. We were very clear about what we're celebrating, that culture and artistry and games and innovation is what we're about. And we have not, you know, those are our values. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, so much of the core mission is find really interesting things in this space that people aren't seeing, that we think people would like to see and they don't know how, and try and share it with them. And we just do that. Our tactics may change from year to year as the space evolves, but the space has not changed to the point where that mission isn't pertinent anymore. Uh, We're 10 years in, and I think we've done a lot of good, and there is a lot of work left to be done. I want to just add to that a couple words about um, our philosophy about diversity. Um, because we also, you know, the game industry has a lot of issues with diversity, and we were very well aware of that, and we even saw that in the indie scene back when we started. Um, you know, if you went, would go to GDC, it was, you know, the usual suspects, essentially, and the philosophy that I brought to the conversation was, came out of working with art games, and what it was was, if you have diverse games, you will have diverse people. So by going to art games, or by going to documentary games, or by going to Twine games. We were able to, um, without doing anything artificial, (laughs) 
merely you know broaden the reach of what the definition of indie. In fact, I was having dinner with Jesper the other night, who's doing research on indie games, and we had this lengthy conversation about what is the definition of indie. And we always felt it should be as broad as possible. And the other thing we did that was, I think, really, really important, um, and I think it was one of the things that led to uh, Tracy's game getting an award the first year, even though it had been rejected from the IGF, was we put in our jury statement, we will not argue about the definition of the word game. This will not be a criteria for exclusion from Indiecade. And we understood that that was really, really important because it had been used many, many times previously to exclude really fantastically spectacular works of art. And we were really proud that Night Journey got in on its own merits through the jury uh, and won an award uh, that you know we recognized we don't need to worry about the semantics of whether or not it's a game. If she thinks it's a game, it's a game. Yeah. Can, I think that somebody should say something about our jury because... Um, <laughs> she touches me. Well, I mean, Celia, you helped us set it up. Sam has worked on it. Maddie can jump in. But, but I think the more I hear about other events and the more I think about what's so important and so core and what, what's at our center is our games, but also our jury and our jurors and our jury process. Now, without going into great detail about how we do it, but it is really if crucial. Celia doesn't mind, I might... Yep. So all I want to say is that this is a bit of an answer to the question Jason was asking. Um, this juror independence that did exist at Slam Dance, where a jury could award something over the president, uh, the way they built their community of filmmakers around it, the way Celia relied on groups of artists working in the field to think as curators for events she had been doing. This stuff informed us, and this idea that we wanted to never really even be able to compromise, that we would be beholden to our jurors and beholden to the community in a way that would prevent us from doing something like what Slam Dance did. What? Oh, yes, Rob is handling us very well and we are confused. Um, okay, uh, anyways, I will finish my answer. So the answer is our jury is built from the community. You show a game in Indiecade, then you go and help pick what shows in Indiecade the next year. And this creates a, a reinforced feedback that people who feel privileged by the community take then a responsibility to help keep that community safe and protected and moving in the right direction. And that this is something we did to address what Jason's talking about, to go after exactly those values. And it is actually beyond the mechanics of how it works that is the core of what is important about our jury. We're the timekeepers, do we have five minutes? Yeah, so just to follow on that, I think diversity of the jury was important. Like, I think part of the reason that um, a game like Night Journey was confusing to other festivals was because there were no academics on their juries or very few. And so we had academics, we had, we had artists, we had writers, we had uh, museum curators and gallery curators. And by broadening that a group, we also then broadened the kinds of games that we both got submitted and that were accepted. Um. I, now I'm not quite hi, sure Maddie. what to say. Does everyone hi. know Maddie? Maddie is I, I'm only been here for a little the bit. The new associate right. director of Indicate, <laughs> and she is the one who wrangled this year's jurying process and got these games and curated. Right. I, I well. Thank you. Also a former game maker from the festival yes. okay. and an all around genius. It has been yes. a pleasure to work with her. This so year. what's what's interesting about uh, Jason's question is that there were definitely, let's say, in the process, um, games that let's say were. I don't want to say shocking, but at least things that were kind of like, ooh, this like disturbed me. And we had to have that conversation. And I think what's interesting about this year, um, the people who I decided, I created the committee. Um, I mean, I recommended a bunch of people and then like, you know, the others were like, these people are cool. I'm like, cool. Um, and the reason um, we could handle those, like there were some games that were submitted, let's say last year that I know I passed on because I was like, I don't really feel this. And then people would maybe resubmit or similar things would come up. And so what I did is I just didn't tell my committee that I had feelings about this. And I wanted to see like what happens when all these other different people think of this. And so when they come back and they're like either, it's usually a range of kind of like, oh gosh, like, you know, exactly what I thought to maybe something different. And we have a conversation about it. And we just are kind of like, what is our, what is our, um, what do we want to be held responsible for? Um, and I think that's, um, there's at least now 10 years after 
there's a definite like savvy one needs when communicating things. Um, now innovation, I guess, or newness is also deftness with the work that you do. Um, and I think um, something like um, Call My Massacre, um, noting its detail, would probably still make it through, I think. Because you see craft and you see um, how someone goes into it, even if it like, shakes you. Um, and I feel like um, I'm a person in particular who leans towards things that make me uncomfortable. Um, I just, it just tends to be a thing I do. Um, and so I feel like right now, um, I, and I think this kind of happened in like kind of discussions last year. Um, so for instance, um, um, an immersive theater group won the best game design award last year. Mm -hmm. And that did not make a lot of people in games very happy. Right. Um, but it was a, it, it was a tough conversation to have in Jerry about like, what is game design and what is it that we want to project into the future? What are the things that um, we find is going to continue to expand and include? Um, and I think that even when people in indies who are way older than me and have been around and have maybe a larger stake in it than I do, get like uncomfortable with the idea of games seeming too foreign to them, um, you know, I feel like that's worth it. I believe, you know, one of the things I've uh, I heard at one of the talks is a lot of people dislike how like fragmented indies seem to them, but in reality, it's just a bunch of people who are already doing work are just being noticed. And so I feel like we're, you know, as we expand, we kind of start to kind of shake up people who have been kind of reckon, uh, have been in the center for a while. And I would add that the way, you know, some of the, some of the things have changed. Our role has changed quite a bit. I mean, um, you know, we you couldn't really get an indie game published on a console when we first started, or at least that was very rare. Um, and then we became essentially a broker, helping consoles to meet indie developers. Um, we went from 98 submissions our first year to around 1,000 this year. I think that's right. Our peak has been was like 12. Hundred. It's a lot. I mean, it's it's a lot. It's a lot of cat herding. <laughs> it's really hard work, um, and a lot of the games are increasingly more unconventional. Um, how do you judge a ceramic fish augmented yeah. reality or a Taiwanese escape room? You know, yeah. we we have to really work hard to get that to happen. But um, the, but as Stephanie said, it's always on the foundation of this core mission that we started with way back. Well, we have only like zero minutes left, <laughs> but I, I wanted to thank everybody um, that's here and uh, indicate a big part of us have, has been our community and our ongoing relationships with each other and how we've all been able to build something together. And I just want to give everybody the opportunity just to say a few, you know, like short, like one, two sentences, um, if there's any kind of reflection that you have Can about. You on the panel. <laughs> Start on that side, that side. Right, yeah, that was, yeah, because, you know, Keith was at our first IndieCade. Jason, it was a big deal when both of them showed up. Tracy's game was at our first IndieCade, but also our first E3. And, and it means a lot to have everybody here. Yeah, Sam should start. Yeah, say something. Me? Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm you. being texted by game developers and speakers about where they're <laughs> supposed to go. Uh, yeah. Um. <laughs> I am very rarely struck speechless, so maybe that's <laughs> all I have to say. Uh, no, I, you know, it is uh, really lovely for me to have the three of you have joined us here. Uh, this has been a huge part of my life. I have believed in this mission for a really long time, and though, as I said earlier, it is far from done, I feel really happy about the work that has happened. The community that exists here at IndieCade uh, fills me with meaning and joy every year when this event happens, and the first people who gave me that are you guys who are sitting here with me, so <laughs> thank you for coming. Just, just been so pleased the, the the whole time. Every time I come to Indicate, I'm just like, it's, it's really special. So thank you so much. Gosh, this is kind of this is so sweet. Um, we work all year long on Indicate. It really does take all year and a lot of people and a lot of work and a lot of effort. And there's a certain point I think every year we're like, oh my gosh, how are we even going to do this? And, and it ends up being kind of my favorite three days of the year. And I enjoy every minute of it. And as tired as I am, I want it to keep going on. 
and seeing and hearing all the stories and the ripples of impact and relationships is so meaningful and I feel like I've I've I have a family that has been created one of those family by choice kind of things but it's just it's it's changed my entire life and made it wonderful so um I remember in 2009 when we had our first um, Culver City event, and after the event, uh, John Sharp came up to us and said, I'd like to take over your conference next year. And that was the beginning of the sort of Katamari effect of IndieCade, which eventually I came to use the phrase, it takes a village to raise a festival, because what is amazing to me is that everybody wants to be part of this. They want to help. They want to work for free to help us make it happen. Um, and that also sustains me, the fact that people always want to be part of this, and no matter how big it gets, that sense of love and family is still still here. Several people have told me this, who went, came to the first one were like, you know what, it still has, the, it's not as intimate, but it still has the positive energy that it's always had. Mm -hmm. um, wow, so everything you guys said, plus I just would like to just say, things like this, the reason to revisit how and why they came about is because it's so important not to take them for granted. It's so important to understand and remember how fragile they are, um, that they do um, depend on the goodwill of so many people, and that you know, if we don't continue to give that goodwill, it's not as if this community just continues on its own. It requires work and mindfulness, and you know, just a continued grind at creating the beautiful thing that it is, right, every day. And so I want to thank you guys for that, but I also just want to say, you know, just let's all remember that. Thank you. Um, so I'll just say that, uh, you know, one of my earliest memories from um, my, the beginning of my game career is uh, Sam shuffling through the snowy, slushy streets of Park City with his balls energy drink free parka or whatever it was that he got uh, as part of swag that we were being handed. Uh, and then the very next year, I believe, um, you know, uh, meeting him again uh, and then meeting Stephanie and Celia at, in, uh, in Bellevue and just sort of those two things are what made me say, hey, I'm doing games now. Like, I, I had been programming for a long time and doing other projects, and I just was kind of doing games casually. It's like, I'll try making a game, but uh, Slam Dance and then Indiecade the next year were the things that really connected me into a community, made me like realize there's other people doing stuff like, kind of more like full time or like it's their whole thing. And that's what basically, you know, for me, I feel like launched me into what I've been doing for the past, you know, to, uh, well, I guess totally 12 years, but in the, in the 10 years since that, um, made me say, yeah, I'm. I'm a game maker now. So thank you, the three of you especially, for continuing to do this so tirelessly and just um, uh, keep it up. Yeah. Thank you for making great games. Um, so actually a couple of, I actually have had a lot of questions of people who um, asked me how to be like more involved, which is such a heartwarming thing to hear, um, mostly because running these events, I, we can we take them for granted, but it takes a lot of emotional labor. Um, and these are people who have other things that you know that that subsist their lives, so they can actually like live. Um, <laughs> and I feel like um, one a question I get very often in my classroom or in classrooms I have are people who are like, well, how do I like just make a successful like indie game, which is like you know like a huge conversation. But the one thing I actually say the most is like I think you need to be a part of a community, um, and kind of be be understand like kind of where are you situated? What are the most interesting things going on? How do you add to a conversation? Um, I feel like no matter how interesting your work is um, by itself, it kind of stands alone, you know, um, and so. I feel like, um, I mean, I, I look back, The first my first speaking gig was at IndieCate, and my first game, the only game I've ever submitted was to IndieCate and it got featured here. Um, and so now I'm kind of more involved and I'm doing a lot of other stuff and I feel like it's just super important to have like spaces like these. So even if, it, even if your answer is like, I don't like IndieCade or I can think of something else and I wanna build it, like do it. And like kind of also just appreciate the people 
who are kind of building things um, because they're also game makers too, you know, so they're doing your job along with another job for you as well. <laughs> so like I would just consider like either help out or figure out how to connect these sorts of resources to people because it's very important, but thanks for all the energy you already give. Well, I, I want to thank everybody here and thank, you know, our whole community of people. We're mostly run by volunteers. We're still not corporate. We're still organizing things from our living rooms. And we're still, you know, here after 10 years. And it's, it is truly with everybody's support that we will continue. Thanks, thank Stephanie. you. Thanks. Thanks.